Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith here for the Jug Life Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Brian Mann. Dr. Mann is a professor of kinesiology and exercise science at the University of Miami. He was also a pretty accomplished powerlifter, uh, strength coach, and professor at the University of Missouri before his, his current uh, position. And we talk with him uh, some about his, his career as a lifter and in academia, as well as sort of his specialty, velocity-based training, get some insights to what that really is and how you could implement it effectively into your training or uh, training for the athletes that you work with. So make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, visit jtsstrength.com to check out all of our online coaching services, Juggernaut AI powerlifting, power building, uh, as well as our weightlifting, strongman, and super total coaching. Get some Juggernaut apparel, buy some of our eBooks, all that good stuff. Share this podcast with your friends. You can find it on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and at jtsstrength.com. Coming to you from Orange County, California, this is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. All right, Brian, thank you uh, for taking the time to, uh, to join me. So we're here at the Mamba Sports Academy, first annual Mamba Sports Conference. And uh, you came out here from Miami, yep. right? So you're a professor at University of Miami. Take, take me through uh, you know, kind of your, your journey to your current position. Yeah, well, you know, it, it kind of started whenever I was uh, little. Because uh, it's no uh, surprise to anybody who's ever seen me. I've got a large red birthmark on my face. I used to get made fun of a lot. So I thought if I got bigger and stronger than everybody else, that they would leave me alone. And uh, so I think it was my 12th birthday. My mom bought me that, uh, the old DP Challenger concrete, plastic covered concrete plates, uh -huh. uh, weight set. And, uh, I, and I started lifting weights. And then before my freshman year in high school, uh, there was a strength and conditioning camp on uh, the Southwest Missouri State campus. And uh, some people who were, uh, who were, who were, in the field for a long time, and some have moved out of the field, uh, but they're still big in the sporting uh, area. Uh, Rob Rogers, who's now working with the military in strength conditioning. Uh, a guy named Kirk Wolfolk, who left, and he's, I think he's still the director at Navy. Uh, he's in like a tenured position there, so he's going to be there until he dies or decides to retire. And a guy named Russ Ball. And uh, Russ is now one of the front office people. He's like a, a step below the GM for the Green Bay Packers. Well, they were all there, and that's whenever I was introduced to the field of strength and conditioning. And uh, I started reading about it, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So in college, I was uh, hungover, and I was skipping one class to study for another. We had a Taco Bell that was in, like, the stadium. Uh, and they, you know, they served on game days, but they were open year round. Mm -hmm. So I had like a endless supply of bean burritos and diet Pepsi to keep me going <laughs> to, to quell the hungover and, and keep me uh, sharp on the studying. And, uh, one of my friends from high school was on the team and he came up and I had won like, you know, a teenage nationals or something like that. And, uh, I was talking with him and whenever Rick Perry came by, who was the head strength and conditioning coach there, he said, Hey, uh, Hey, uh, you know, Coach Perry, meet my friend Brian. Uh, he's a power lifter and he won nationals. And we started talking. And I knew this is exactly what I wanted to do as a profession. Uh, and he said, do you want a job? I can't pay you anything. Yes, sir, I do. And I closed up my uh, book on organic chemistry and went up and started working that day. And uh, within a couple of weeks, I had my own teams, which is completely different than today. You got to remember uh -huh. that, you know, 20 years ago, uh, it, we're in our situation specifically, it was one strength coach, 23 sports, 500 athletes. So here's somebody who's fairly competent, who knows strength training technique. Uh, you know, I wasn't writing my own program at that point. I didn't do that till the next semester, uh, but I had my own sports that I was working with. And I went from there to uh, intern at, uh, for Joe Kennedy, Arizona State University. And then in a, a bad stroke of luck, my dad was... Were you and Uwe at uh, ASU? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yep. And uh, Cheyenne Petrie was there. Uh, and Leanne Blinn had just... Cheyenne uh, had just left and Leanne was just coming in. 
and in a, a bad stroke of luck, uh, my dad took a, a, a turn for the worse. So he, I knew he was uh, not in good condition, but I decided to go ahead and take the opportunity to go out there and work for Joe Ken anyways. And uh, he had just won strength coach of the year. I thought, hey, this is somebody I can learn from. Uh, he got he took a turn for the worse, and uh, I went back to Oklahoma, where I'm originally from, uh, and in- ended up finishing my internship under Pat Ivey at University of Tulsa. Uh, I went back to Missouri State. It was, it's Missouri State now, it's Southwest Missouri whenever I was there, uh, because they found out over the course of the summer that how much I actually did, and Rick couldn't do it on his own, they mm-hmm. found. So uh, they created a position for me. And so I went back there for a year, and Pat went to Missouri uh, from Tulsa. He played at Missouri. He did coached at Missouri before. So whenever Jeff Fish left and went to, took a job with the Oakland Raiders, they brought Pat back. And uh, he brought me up there. So I was walking in with a master's certificate, postgraduate certificate, you know, uh, two classes shy of a master's. And I walked into a graduate assistant position there. So I did uh, the two years as a GA uh, at Missouri, and then I just continued on. So I had all those credits that transferred in uh, to go towards the PhD. Uh, and then I went and got that in education school and counseling psych. Uh, ended up getting a dual role at Missouri for five years, six years. Uh, dual role meaning that uh, I was almost hired by another university as a professor. And the uh, Department of Physical Therapy chair heard about it. And he's like, hey, you know what? It's really hot and humid. And that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, uh, it looks like I ended up in a, a similar climate. Yeah. Anyway. He's like, I well, don't they, know if you realize this. They, they knew how to appeal to a big man. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> Sweating through my khakis, yeah. walking through class. But uh, so then uh, he, true to his word, he's like, hey, you give me three days, I'll have you a job. Just slow play them for three days and I'll have you a job if you want it. And true to his word, he, he did. Uh, then, uh, you know, that was fantastic for a long time. Uh, being able to coach and also still be a uh, you know be a professor and a practitioner at the same time it was at division one it's unheard of then the uh, protests happened state funding got cut enrollment took a nosedive so missouri was operating on a huge deficit and they ended up cutting i believe it was a total of like 305 uh, positions between faculty and staff shut down entire departments so um yeah, I put a post out on social media and um, that, hey, I'm a free agent. And uh, a job came open at University of Miami, and I applied for it and got it. It's the uh, only job that I've actually applied for uh, in my life that I actually, like, cold call, you know, cold applied for. I didn't know anybody there on campus, uh, and, and here I am. So now I'm an assistant professor at the University of Miami uh, in the Department of Kinesiology and Sports Sciences. I do... Uh, Masters of Strength and Conditioning classes, and I do undergrad ex phys classes, and I do a lot of sports science type stuff for the different teams at University of Miami. I do a tremendous amount with baseball. Uh, you know, Brian Gabriel is their strength coach, and he's uh, just had an open door policy, and he's like, "Hey, you know what? If you, you know, I want to learn from you, uh, and just whenever you want to come over, come over, and let's figure some stuff out." So we've been doing a lot of stuff with force plates. Uh, force velocity profiling, uh, and we're just continuing to move on and on and on and uh, really break down the uh, sport of baseball and training for baseball to see, hey, what what can influence performance? Uh, the track team, I'm doing a lot with them, uh, swimming and diving, uh, volleyball. Uh, I've done a little bit here and there with some of the other sports, but uh, those are the ones that I'm doing the most of. And I'll, I'll work with any of them. Uh, they just... They have to want to do it. I'm not going to go in and impose my will uh, because I'm not a paid athletic. Uh, I'm not paid through athletics, mm-hmm. so this stuff is all uh, volunteer because I like it, uh, and uh, and I'm not going to try and make one more work for myself or two drama. I'm 40 years old, man. You know, like Mike Gundy. I'm a man. I'm 40. <laughs> uh, finally, I'm a man. I guess. Uh, it's with one N or two, whichever one you want to <laughs> choose for that. But, uh, you know, I'm just d- doing my thing and uh, enjoying life there and, and having a real good time. So you had this, this unique distinction as, as professional and practitioner, uh, as, a, as coach, and then 
also along the way for a lot of that, you were a competitor yourself yeah. in, in powerlifting. So talk, talk a little bit about your experience with competitor, competitive powerlifting, because that's a lot of our you know, meathead type of oh, audience yeah. likes that. <laughs> yeah, no, and I wrote the book, Powerlifting. So I, you know, I got into it as the result of the lifting weights for so long, you know, and uh, just I happened to run into a guy at a gym, and, uh, you know, I'm an opportunist. He was like, hey, I think you'd be a good powerlifter. Why don't you enter this meet? So I did, and uh, I didn't have a squat suit or a bench shirt. I didn't even know what they were, and I didn't even know what the deadlift was. Yeah, to, to about squat suits and bench shirts. When I did my first powerlifting meet, which was 2010, I remember going on Elite to get a singlet, and I was like talking to Rhonda, the customer service yeah, lady, yeah, yeah. on the phone. Rhonda's great. Yeah, and I was asking her, I was, I was like, "Can you send me this this metal uh, ace squatter?" And she's like, she's like, aren't you doing the meat raw? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, well, that's a squat suit. And I, I didn't understand because I, I was coming from track. You know, and I'd read, I was sponsored by Leo CS, but yeah. I, I didn't really know that. I'd never been to a powerlifting meet. So I, I was just looking at this page and I saw these one, they all kind of looked alike, singlets yeah. and squat suits. And like, this one looks the best. Yeah, I was like, well, <laughs> this one's $250 and this one's $50. So I obviously want the $250 one. Yeah. And the the bench shirt, I didn't understand that concept either. I just said, like, oh, I guess you have to wear like a specific shirt to bench. That's yeah. like the uniform for for right. benching or something. Yeah. That I I did not I didn't understand what those were. Right. Yeah. No. It's uh, it, it was a lot of fun. You know, like I was telling you off uh, earlier this morning that uh, you know powerlifting is something that uh, you know I, I anchored my life to as a youngster. Uh, in addition to the birthmark, it was one of those bad lifetime movie type things. So, you know, uh, my father is a brilliant man and he was very, very good at what he did, but he had some inner demons and uh, and he would get drunk and then violence would, would start. Uh, you know, I've seen, I watched my mom get raped at gunpoint. Um, he shot at me for trying to stop and then knocked me out, uh, pistol whipped and then thrown into the, the fireplace. Uh, at one point in time, whenever they uh, were going through a separation, we spent uh, a month on a half a pack of hot dogs and a continental box of Frosted Flakes. So, you know, I, it's like I'm fat now, but I do not do well doing, being hungry. And, uh, you know, I, I, if I get hungry, I get very, very angry. Uh, hangry on steroids is, <laughs> is me, and I, I think it kind of goes, goes back to that. Uh, so dealing with that trauma is one of the things that really led me into powerlifting and going deep down that rabbit hole because that allowed me to, uh, through that physical exercise, to, uh, to well, one, it's just, it was a stress release, uh, and two, it allowed me to compartmentalize. And, and whenever I was in the gym, that was the only thing that mattered. Uh, you know, that with, uh, you know the, the people talking about the hardcore stuff, that's, that's why I was drawn to it. And also because, I mean, I'd been lifting weights already. I was strong and uh, I was good at it. Uh, so, of course, if you're good at something, you're going to gravitate towards it. And that's that's what let me down. I think I ended up, I squatted a grand. It was not in a sanctioned meet. I, and it was probably high. But, you know, with some of the squats that I've seen pass by, you know, <laughs> now, I think that would, would have been asked to grass if it might through consideration. It is, you know, powerlifting judging is... I think really encapsulates the idea of give them an inch and they take a mile. Yeah. And I, I've heard people, you know, who talked about Brent Mixel squatting that 1100, I think when he did that and people at the time complained and said it was really high. And now that's like the one that, that is, you know, these raw multiply judging arguments come about They're yeah. like, well, why can't you guys squat as deep as Brent Mixel? And yeah, so like right. now yeah. it looks deep and then it looked high and, and it's like, it just it all just changes you know time changes the perspective on those kind of things oh yeah yeah i benched around 800 a little over i i actually hit 860 uh the workout before i ripped my tricep off and you know that was just a couple of weeks before uh i think al, al caslow was putting on a, a best of the midwest meet and i th- believe it was 2010 whenever that happened so that was the last time whenever, so whenever I was done competing is whenever you started. Mm, yeah. I went from 96 to 2010 uh, doing competitions. And uh, deadlift, I always sucked at, man. Big gut, short arms, little hands, you know, smelled like cabbage <laughs> you know, from Austin Powers. And, uh, you know, so I think it was like 6, 650 maybe. 
So I could bench way more than I could uh, deadlift. Yeah. But I was bit, I was built to bench, but I went, didn't actually get to be a good bench presser for a long time. Uh, it wasn't until um, there was a guy who was a strength coach at Syracuse now named Keith Caton. Oh, I know Keith very yeah. well. Yeah, and he's I, from when he was at Baylor. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Keith and I were training partners, and he's the one that actually taught me how to bench press. So I was just a squat guy, and bench press was my rest. And then eventually I became a bench only guy or, uh, you know, as Louie calls them, bench fags <laughs> and, uh, or flamingo, as uh, other people have said. But obviously, even now that I don't train a lot, I've still got some pretty big legs. So I don't think I would ever qualify as a flamingo. But, uh, yeah, and that's where I ended up. And uh, it just that, that bench only whenever I finally got it. I wish I could have put all three together. I would have had a really good total, but I never did. Yeah. So I started powerlifting in 2010 and got... It was probably about 2012, 13 is when the big shift to, to a lot more raw competing was going on. And I, that's what I've always done. But I, I got my time experiencing SPF Pro-Am meets and, you know, and the ballroom of a day's in in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think I, it was, <laughs> was the word horse in that. Oh, no, that was in Nashville, not Knoxville. Yeah, I, I was in yeah. Knoxville, yeah. yeah. Or, or at, you know, the convention center in Cincinnati, those kind of things. Yeah. And that world of powerlifting, the culture of that kind of late, late, mid to late 2000s multiply powerlifting, I think, was, is so different than the culture of powerlifting today. And, and it's different. You go to, you know, I've been at these huge untested meets versus USAPL nationals, IPF worlds, and it's a, a much different field. Do you, do you have any relatively safe for work memories that you can share from multi, like just something that, that, like encapsulates that multiply powerlifting super. How, how many beanies with flames on them do you own? Man, that, you know what? That I, I think uh, is the I true, think I, the I never had testament. the beanie with the flames okay. on it, but Lou gave me a ball cap with the flames All on right. it. So I never had the beanie. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go full Chuck V on that one, but uh, he's an amazing person. Yeah. I always love sitting down with Chuck. Very, very quiet uh, and, and exudes an intensity that, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, I think. Uh, one of my friends that trained with Chuck and Tony at Westside Barbell, it, you'll occasionally hear the guys talk about Doc Dave. Mm -hmm. Well, it, that's Dave Beversdorf, who's a world-renowned autism and uh, uh, Alzheimer's researcher. And he was my training partner in, in Columbia. But he said at best, you know, Chuck V makes grown men piss themselves. <laughs> so uh, I think if I had to pick one item to, like, this is multiply powerlifting and you're going to put it in a time capsule, I think the flame beanie. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, and I think Dave did uh, Neutron. Uh, God, what is his last name? He, he's a West Side. Dave Hoff. Uh, Hoff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I always knew him as Neutron uh, from back before, I guess, he, you know, when he was like 14, 15. Uh -huh. uh, I think he brought the uh, Flame Beanie back uh, at the WPO last year, I heard. I, I didn't yeah. see it. Uh, let's be, you know, some of the stories that encapsulate power. Well, shoot, you know, there was dudes that... Uh, you know, puke all over the ref, the head official, whenever they're squatting. I've seen that happen a few times. I, it was not me. Uh, I'm trying to think of ones that I can tell, and it's not going to incriminate somebody. I, I remember hearing in, in a WPO meet uh, Alexander Kucher, uh, the, like 165 okay. Polish lifter, extremely yeah. strong, that I think this WPO at some point got to like a 36-hour weigh-in. So extreme, extremely extreme weight cuts were happening. Yeah. And that he had his blood drawn to make weight. I didn't, I, yeah, man, that, I, that's the first time <laughs> I heard that. I, I know a lot of people would uh, take uh, diuretics and yeah. then they would get an IV and rehydrate afterwards. Uh, that's the, I had not heard about that, that when, you know, I wouldn't put it past anybody. Yeah. I, I don't know him from Adam, so I couldn't uh, confirm or deny that, but, uh, you know, I, I've heard about that. I've heard about, you know, guys going and just, uh, and you know what, that's not even with multiply, but that's just lifters in, in general where they would go to a, a farm and tax store and you start reading labels and <laughs> start taking shit that, yeah. uh, whatever they could find. That horse they liniments and whatnot. Well, not just yeah. the horse liniments, but you know, like, uh, a, a drug to make cows put on weight. Uh -huh. Well, then they would start taking Hef it. Hefedrol. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Hefedrol. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to remember the, uh, the, the actual thing that they would uh, they would use heat 
and the tablets, and I can't remember what those tablets were called, that they were in, they would like inject them into the cow's ear, and it was an implant that would stay there for X amount of time. Like a Thinaflex tablet? That was it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what Tren is made of. Yeah, Thinaflex, yeah, 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 yeah. Trimbalone acetate, that's yeah. right. I'm, uh, the, the caffeine has not kicked in fully <laughs> to recover from last night to, uh, to remember those things. But, you know, so guys doing that and the horse liniments and, uh, uh, you know, Dave, one time he uh, knocked a rib out of place, but he still had to compete because, I mean, you're not going to train for this meet for yeah. six months and, and not go because you knocked a rib out of place. So he uh, duct taped his whole torso uh-huh. so that the ribs would stay into place and not get thrown out for whenever he benched. And uh, I can't, I think he probably hit like 550 or 600. Yeah. But uh, that's probably on the extreme side when they were doing that. Um, yeah, you know, for, I'm, I guess, a pretty renowned critic, let's say, of, of a lot of things of multi-ply powerlifting. But I do have a unique appreciation for the commitment that a lot of, the, you know, whether you're getting your blood drawn to make weight or duct taping your ribs together to yeah. get a bench in. I, I don't know that I look at that and I'm like, man, that's a good idea. To do, but I do appreciate the yeah. I do appreciate the commitment. So th- this weekend at the Mamba conference, you're going to be talking about uh, you know, I guess what sort of your your specialty, your trademark velocity. I'll based be talking training. a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah, and well, give me give me the elevator speech, or, you know, of what is what is velocity based training. So velo- velocity based training is basically um, I compare it to a roadmap versus GPS, right? The training that we've done forever is the roadmap. You know, I went from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, I'm sorry, Springfield, Missouri, to 18th and Indian School Road in Phoenix, Arizona. And I got lost. Well, I wouldn't even call it lost. I just thought I was on, took the wrong exit. Uh, and, you know, people have been using these maps for millennia, and they work. They work just fine. With my GPS, interesting side note that my wife's stepdad was like one of the guys that made like GPS used for aerospace engineering. He's a he's a no shit rocket scientist. Mm-hmm. You, know, you ask him what time it is, he'll tell you how the watch is made. But uh, I know from him that at any point in time, I know the GPS will have me triangulated within 36 inches. So I know exactly when I need to turn right, exactly when I need to turn left, and shoot with some of the updates that just popped up on my uh, my phone. It'll tell me even what how fast I'm going, where the speed limit is there, and if there's a cop up ahead. They need to get better on that because they usually <laughs> say there's a cop up ahead and he's right there like 10 feet from me, so I don't have enough time to hit the brake. But uh, the VBT is just the, the GPS versus the, the map. Uh, it takes into account some additional stressors. Now, I came out with the zones, and the zones were for based off a Division I athlete norms. Uh, And whenever you've got a sport that, uh, well, for traditional team sports in the collegiate environment, strength training is GPP, right? And the sport training is SPP. So they're only going to be using those movements, and they're only going to be getting good at them in a general sense. They're not going to be trying to lock in the different positions at which you should tuck and flare your elbows yeah. on a bench press. It's, yeah, I mean, the, the best lifter of a foot, you know, the best football player lifter is kind of nothing nothing special in the powerlifting and weightlifting Usually, sense. yeah. There's been a couple that, you know, like I remember Sean Weatherspoon and Xavier Gooden both squatted in the seventh weighing, you know, about 230, uh, 240. So, you know, and it was legit, yeah. you know, below parallel. So, you know, nine, nine times out of ten, yeah, but uh, you get that, that one occasional freak. But uh, – the uh, so for powerlifting, the zones that I came up with they don't work because that's SPP. And the longer that you train, the more neuromuscular efficiency you gain, which would make somebody think that no, you can move fast. Well, no, it's that you can continue the movement going even slower. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like Dave's uh, max bench press was like 0. 0.07 meters per second. I know Chris Duffin posted one of his uh ungodly i don't know 10 million pound deadlifts and <laughs> it was at 0. 0.08 meters per second and i see speeds nowhere near that in the college environment but again where the football player they're lifting weights to make them better at practice well for power lifters their practice is lifting weights so the uh, neuromuscular efficiency that's gained from that because of it being spp changes things so that the velocities all shift down uh so for the power lifter, basically, you collect a load velocity profile. Uh, 
and you would just track it. And so then I would know that if uh, 80% for me was, I'm sorry, 60% for me was 0.8 meters per second, then every time that I hit 0.8 meters per second, I know that I'm 60% of that day. Some days you're having a good day and you're lifting heavier loads. Some days are bad days and you're lifting lighter loads. And that usually goes into uh, take into account all the different stressors that you might be undergoing. Maybe it's physical stress, emotional stress, whatever. Uh, you've got to take those into account. Otherwise, you're going to overshoot or undershoot your training. Uh, you know, they, there was a, a study from uh, a paper, rather, from uh, Yovanovitch and Flanagan. And they had in there the preseason tested 1RM going in this dash line across. And they had a velocity predicted 1RM. And those are pretty accurate. You know, uh, I've always found at least they were accurate for whenever you use an individual's equation. Some days they were the, the daily predicted 1RM was, you know, they were 25 kilos up, 22 kilos up above the uh, pre-tested 1RM. Sometimes they were 20 kilos down. Uh, 30 kilos down. And so we see that there's like a 100-pound swing that they could be at. Now, I've been to Vegas several times for these conferences, and I found out through those I'm not a lucky individual. Uh, so the velocity allows me to use the right load for that day with all the uh, outside stressors that the person's undergoing uh, versus only being right whenever I got lucky. Uh -huh. And somebody's experience can absolutely change the loads, and they know what should feel right for that day and maybe they're using rpe or something to uh, to do that uh, rather than velocity so i mean there's other ways to do it too well, i see guys like uh mike Tashir using both right and, yeah and mike Tashir, i think in the in the powerlifting world is i don't know if the the father of rpe but but certainly one of the, the people who really pushed that to the forefront yeah and i i've said at seminars before that i don't think mike does rpe because he's got a tendo on one side of the bar and a gym wear on the other side of the bar, he does RE because there's no perception about yeah. it anymore. When you when you're tracking every single rep of every set that you do, he he knows his personal you know force velocity profile mm -hmm. and uh, Blaine Sumner the, the same way. When he he knows when I do a thousand pounds at this speed, that means I can do you know I'm ready to do 1150. Or when I do 900 oh, yeah. at this speed, I'm ready to do 1200. And so that they're taking so much of that intuition, perception out, out of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's fantastic for that. Whenever you're dealing with small groups, you can absolutely dial in on that. But, you know, dealing with large teams, you know, that's whenever I went with the zones. Yeah. Because, you know, if it's I got a hundred people. More of a trend then. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it was about the trend. It's about the mean rather than, uh, than anything else. And, so in a, in a team setting with, with the zones... Then would you be like, you know, rather than work up to a three rep max just based on weight, it's going to you know, work up to a, as heavy of a triple you can while staying within this zone? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then it was mostly in our dynamic effort type mm -hmm. stuff whenever we did that because that feedback caused them to go harder and have a greater quality. You know, there's a study that came out from a guy named William Randall and uh, Nick Gill and Mike McGuigan were on the paper. Nick Gill is the head strength coach for the New Zealand All Blacks, right? Uh, so you can, uh, they looked at some semi-pro and professional uh, rugby athletes and they had the same program, uh, same w uh, sets, reps, loads, uh, rest. The only thing that varied was on the squat jumps that they did twice a week. One group got the feedback of velocity, the other group did not. So these are trained athletes, mm -hmm. pro athletes who should have a pretty high level of training status. They saw a huge like 6%, 7% increase in vertical jump in six weeks just from getting the feedback of the velocity. So whenever we could throw that feedback on the power movements, it just made the power movements that much more effective. Just because the athlete's putting that much more intent yeah. towards, towards I moving the bar. I, I think the, the intent combined with the, the group setting of it and – these guys aren't aren't on the all blacks because they're not competitive. Right. You know, they're they're seeing what their teammate did and they oh, want to yeah. beat that and And you know, I would be over there stirring the pot. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, you know, Jason got uh, one point two a uh, hundred kilos today. You know, that that's uh that's ninety kilos and you know but, 0.05 lower than that. I'm just saying. I'm not telling you what to do. But yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> so I'd be stirring the pot the whole time. I love yeah. doing that. I was the cook in there, the chef. Yeah. You know, that, that's one of my you know, regrets, I, I suppose, from my shot put career was that I didn't have access to, to something like a tendo unit um, because with, 
you know, with, with the shot put, the, what I tell people a lot of times, it's like six, 16 pounds isn't heavy. Yeah. You know, when you bench 500 pounds or 600 pounds, like some of these Olympic level shot putters are doing, 16 pounds ain't shit, but it's about how fast can you make it go. And you got to yeah. make, make it go, you know, 13 meters per second in the throw to throw 70 feet. And, you know, so what good is moving 500 pounds slow ish right. rather than 300 pounds? as fast as you possibly yeah, can, like move, moving heavy shit fast. And the, the ability to track that with, with, you know, these different devices would be so significant. I think for, for those kind of, for, for any speed power athlete, when it's about how fast can you, know, how hard can you deliver this punch? You know, how fast can you get this implement moving rather than just how heavy a weight can you lift it? No matter how slowly it goes up. Right. Yeah. No, that's absolutely it. Yeah, and I had the the throwers at Mizzou. Whenever I had them, we were doing a lot of velocity stuff on the Olympic lifts, and uh, if we were doing a squat for power, I mean, because you can do one movement, you can do it for strength, you can do it through power, you can do it for you know the absolute speed, uh, you know, velocity component. Uh, you could do it for for any of them. So anytime that I was looking at trying to enhance power, we threw the VBT on there, and I used it as a uh, minimum threshold on the Olympic lifts. And all of a sudden, the coach was like, dude, I don't know what you're doing, but they're looking fast in the ring. I'm like, sweet. And you know, whenever the, uh, the track coach who had been writing the throws program for 20 years mm-hmm. gives it to you and he says that, it was like, I could actually sigh relief. You know, knowing that kind of, you know, that he did it because he felt it was that important that he was writing the program. It had, you know, I, my butthole was kind of tight whenever I was starting to write the program for them. And then whenever that happened, I could finally relax and be me and not, not have to worry about it. But, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was great for that intent, man. And the intent it causes a greater quality of uh, repetition. That accumulation of greater quality leads to a better adaptation of power. So with the inclusion of, of you know, velocity tracking in weightlifting movements particularly, there's only... There's only one American weightlifting coach currently that comes to mind that I know uses that. Spencer Arnold that is down in Georgia, and he's got uh, Jordan De La Cruz, who's probably one of our top five or six female lifters, uh, and a couple other very very high level lifters. And he's he's putting Tendo or Jim Ware on the on the bar with them. Um, what I see a lot of times with sport performance coaches is this debate of you know type of kind of dynamic effort with the power lifts versus Olympic lifts um, in terms of developing power. Uh, so as you include you know, measuring the velocity of the bar, do you, do you see one as, a, or how did, how did the two compare to you, like a, dy- a dynamic effort squat versus power clean? You know, I think that a lot of people have drawn lines in the sand and they think that, I'm gonna kind of stop and take a, a different approach on this and then circle back around to it. We fail at the margins of our own limitations, right? And most people who are in strength and conditioning are not in strength and conditioning uh, by happenstance. They're in there because they love lifting weights. Mm-hmm. And most people come from a background of either powerlifting or Olympic weightlifting. So the area that they come from is how they are going to be viewing yeah. everything. Now, I don't think that one... Can you do a squat for strength speed? So Olympic lifts are speed strength by nature. Right, they are speed strength by nature. They're supposed to be fast and explosive. Yeah, like you can't really speed. do a slow snatch. No, no, you you can do a slow clean because uh, that's whenever I found out that the cleans weren't transferring uh, for our uh, uh, jumps and sprints, and then whenever we started throwing velocity on there as a component, as a threshold, that they had the bar had to be moving over this. And honestly, it was because of poor technique. Whenever you get down to it, because uh, we were in a uh, the head coach wants numbers, right? So if your head coach yep. wants something, you're going to give him that. Because if you don't, somebody else will. Because yeah. you would fire your ass and get somebody else. Yeah, to do very it. very easy metric to report to a head coach. Yeah, I had this many guys lift this much weight. Right, and and he wanted that. Uh, so then we saw that there was no transfer, and then whenever we because uh, they were doing their cleans at like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 meters per second, and that's mean velocity. Well. And we started out with mean velocity because that's all the original Fitcherdine was, was mean velocity in English and metric units, uh, velocity and power in English and metric units. Uh, so whenever we threw that on there, all of a sudden they started, you know, jumping higher and running faster. So 
But uh, getting back to it, the body only cares about the stimulus that's placed upon it. Right? It's a specific adaptation as opposed to man's. There are no exercises that have this magic pixie dust. Yeah, it doesn't know squats or cleans it, or jumps. It, it knows stress and stimulus. Yeah, yeah. and it knows. Uh, and some people debate about the terminology, you know, strength, speed, speed, strength. There's load, velocity, velocity, load uh, coming from strength, speed, speed, strength comes from the Soviet literature. Velocity, load, load, velocity comes from the uh, the Nordic uh, literature. Uh, but they mean the same shit. You know, strength condition to speed and speed and condition to strength. And we know from a uh, paper by uh, Masahiro Kaneko, uh, who studied this with different movements that, hey, what are the adaptations of these different things? Well, at 60%, you had, an, which was strength speed, you have an equal improvement in force and velocity, basically. You've got this intermediate load and it causes power to go up. The speed strength is greater on the speed, the greater velocity emphasis, and less on the force, but it still makes power go up and it actually brings power in. And what do I mean by bringing power in? That it doesn't make as big of an arch anymore, it moves in. And that's a good thing because you only have about 200, 200, 250 milliseconds to express power in sport, other than uh, the barbell sport. Mm -hmm. So if I can take power and I can shift it over that direction, that's what I want to have happen. Now, the body doesn't care if it's cleans and snatches. That's a great way to develop speed strength. Uh, it doesn't care if it's jumps. And some people debate about that, but it's in meta-analysis. You know, it's several different meta-analyses and individual research papers that are out there show that there is no difference, no statistical difference between jump training and Olympic weightlifting in terms of the adaptations of speed and power. So, you know, there's that. And that, that drives a lot of people nuts, and people call me pariah for that. But Well, I think... Yeah, it's, it's like faulty logic that a lot of coaches use, whether they come from a weightlifting background or whatever, to, to think, well, weightlifting makes athletes powerful and explosive because the athletes I know for being who are good at weightlifting are powerful and explosive it would be akin to saying well, playing basketball makes you tall. Right. Like the people yeah. who are in the Olympics for weightlifting are there because, because they are fast power. and explosive. Yeah. Not because uh, the, the Olympic lifts. Yeah, it that. may have marginally enhanced it, but, yeah. but they were going to be that right. anyways. Yeah, correlation does not imply causation. Yeah. So uh, on that note, I mean, that's how we kind of started changing the way that we did the Olympic lifts. Because whenever we actually looked at the change scores over the, you know, from year to year to year, uh, we found that there was no relationship. So if we're doing an exercise for this intended purpose of speed and explosiveness, and we're not seeing the adaptation, do, continuing it to do that way is like pissing in a fan. It don't make no sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we had to change it. So you know there is no difference. You know, can you make people fast and explosive with Olympic weightlifts? Yes. Can you make them fast and explosive with jump training? Yes. Can you make them fast and explosive through high band resistance, low bar weight, high velocity squatting? Yes. Doesn't matter. The body just recognizes the adaptation. It doesn't give two shits about how it came from. It mm. came about. Awesome. Well, Brian, where uh, where can people learn more from you besides classrooms at the University of Miami? Yeah, so there's obviously there. And honestly, I'm putting out some uh, through there. Interestingly enough, they put this, brought this up. I don't know if we talked about it last night, but I'm doing uh, some certificate programs. for. Uh, there's one that will be published pretty soon that's just on general strength training. Drink general strength and conditioning. Then we'll have a couple that are on uh, technology for monitoring and technology for performance enhancement, and then another one for recovery modalities. And those should be popping out in the next year or two, and it's going to be set up to be a CEU course uh, that'll be ran kind of like a college course. It'll be through Blackboard and everything. It'll be discussion forums, assignments, and things. So they'll get a lot of CEUs out of it and some practical experience. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff that's out there on Elite FTS, uh, Simply Faster. Uh, I've I don't know what all websites I've put stuff uh -huh. out on right now, to be honest with you. Uh, the NCAA, I wrote one for them. Um, you know, journal of Strength and Conditioning Research article, Strength and Conditioning Journal Research. Uh, uh, strength and Conditioning Journal, excuse me. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff out there. Uh, I'm always easy to get a hold of on Twitter. Uh, it's just at J. Brian Mann. Uh, same thing for Instagram. Facebook, I think I'm getting close to the 5,000, so people can add me on there. Uh, if they want, but if I'm at my limit, I can't can't add, add people on. But uh, and then my email is just bman at miami.edu, and uh, you know I'm out speaking whenever I can, uh, and you know they can 
look it up. And if they got questions, they can always contact me. I try and get back to people. Uh, if I don't get back to them, what I always tell them is just send me another email in three days or shoot me a tweet. And uh, while I might get 200, 300 emails a day based off of the different interactions on campus and mm -hmm. students and things, I might get one tweet. So I might be really busy, but I'm not very popular. <laughs> and uh, so they can always reach me through social media is the easiest way. Great. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. I'm, I, I, you know, when I asked you, when I messaged you about this the other day, I had not remembered that our only previous interaction was that I had published an article which someone had plagiarized from you. <laughs> so I opened up the messenger and I looked at it. I was like, oh, shit, this is not the great second message to send. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'm good. glad that we got all that yeah. sorted out. And very nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for listening to that episode with Dr. Brian Mann, Professor of Kinesiology and Exercise Science at the University of Miami. We recorded that while we were at the Mamba Sports Academy and their first annual strength and conditioning conference. Uh, if you're in the Southern California area, if you've got kids and looking for sport performance coaching, definitely check out Mamba Sports Academy, incredible facility. Subscribe to the channel, visit jtsstrength.com, you know, check out our books, our online coaching, all that good stuff. Like this video, share it with your friends. Thanks for watching. See you next week.